Hidden our joy, hidden our sorrow, bearing our past, living tomorrow, living our vice, living our drinking, living our threats, living our breaking.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to those of you who are here and those of you streaming online either now or later. We are the Buffalo Vineyard Church, and we're grateful to be following this, this king unlike any other king. We uh, teach people what his ways are, and his ways are good and loving and just, and they include everybody. One of the things I like, um, a phrase I heard years ago, as, is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. So if you're a millionaire business person uh, or someone um, on the roadside that everyone's forgotten, God sees and God knows and God loves and God cares. So that's what we're about. That's what we teach people and uh, train people by. We do this by regularly encountering God um, through uh, teaching people um, the ways of King in the faith, in the ways of King Jesus, and uh, effectively serving our neighbors. We're going to learn about um, something that happened in our neighborhood yesterday in a moment, but let me just give you a couple of updates here. Um, if we can, I am I going to turn the slide? Here we go. Yeah, so thank you for your input about communion. We are going to reintroduce it actually next Sunday. Leadership has really spent a lot of time thinking and praying and planning through this. Uh, we will be using individual serving uh, cups that come together with the with the bread and the um, and the juice together uh, that'll be available here we won't be doing a procession or anything to come up front so we're trying to do it as safely as possible and just to give you a heads up at home if you're uh, participating in worship at home you can have some elements ready uh, for next Sunday so that'll be exciting uh, so there's light at the end of the tunnel but it's still a pretty long tunnel uh, the next thing we want to give you a bit of an update about supporting the Letterber family. Um, Christy is at Roswell, and um, they've set up a Caring Bridge website, which is a wonderful way to have a, a, a central location where we can hear from them directly, and we can find out ways we can help. Certainly, I know a lot of us have been praying 24-7, thinking about that precious family. Um, when one suffers, we all suffer. So uh, if you need information about that Caring Bridge website, you can contact contact us here at the church and, and we can help you along. So yeah, yesterday was a very special event at Five Loaves Farm, so I'm going to um, invite Elena up to uh, tell us a little bit about what happened yesterday. Good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Elena. And yeah, for the past few weeks, I've been participating at the volunteer times on Saturdays at Five Lowe's Farm. This is a picture of us from last week um, or a couple weeks ago. Um, but it was a really exciting day yesterday because it was um, a celebration of Earth Day, um, which is just a really cool opportunity to think about how um, this beautiful planet that God created for us is just a wonderful gift. And there's so many ways we can give back and try to steward it better. And I think Five Lowe's Farm does a great job. Um, but I was just thinking, I was trying to ex think of a good way to explain why I think um, volunteering at the farm is so important to me. And actually yesterday I was talking to one of the farm youth staff. Um, his name's La Ba, and he volunteered or worked at the farm last year too. And, and he was saying um, one of his reasons why he loves being at the farm so much is because it's so peaceful. And I was like, yeah, that's so true. Um, part of our mission at v Buffalo Vineyard is regularly encountering God, encountering God, excuse me, and I feel that every time I'm working at the farm. And there's a contemplation time before we start working every mo every Saturday morning, and I have found that there's just so much peace that can be found when you're surrounded by nature and taking the time to just stop and think and meditate and reflect. Um, so it's been a beautiful gift for myself and I know for a lot of other people that have been coming out regularly. So I'd invite if anyone's interested in even just having a space where you can um, be calm, be present and, and be uh, connected to the earth physically even, um, this is a great way to do that. And then yesterday was an awesome opportunity to see how so many people want to serve our neighborhood. Um, a group came from Nichols School, a bunch of middle schoolers and their parents. We had a regular group that comes every week and then the staff and people from the neighborhood in the church. So it was like 40 people that showed up yesterday, which is awesome. Um, and we just had a blast weeding, working in the sun, talking, getting to know each other. Brent and Nora were there too, helping out, and that was an amazing time. So it's been a really fun way to get to know people. If you're looking for a way to get connected at Vineyard um, and a way to serve and give back, I would definitely invite everyone to join us next Saturday at 10 a.m. So thanks, everybody. Awesome. 
Hey, because kids are such an important part of the kingdom of God, uh, we always want to focus on how can we communicate uh, good, solid Jesus things to kids. And, and uh, Mr. John has another kid's time for us this morning. Hello friends, Mr. John here. I'm about to transplant a cabbage I grew in my basement under some lights to the garden outside since it's warm and sunny now. So, do you know about plants and the things they need to grow? So here in my hand, I've got a little cabbage. All right, I grew it from a leftover cabbage from the store and now I can grow it a little bit bigger and grab some leaves when I need them and I'm gonna put it in this hole outside. Plants have roots, see? And these roots grow in the soil and they drink up water that you pour in the soil and other nutrients. So let me put this plant in here. I'm gonna pour my water from my watering can all around. Now the cabbage has some water. Do you know what else uh, plants need? Plants need sun. There's lots of sun out today. So the sun is going to be eaten up by the leaves of the plant and make some food for the plant. Did you know that like plants, we need things too? Sometimes they're physical things that you can touch. We call those things tangible, tangible things. You can touch water, feel water, right? But the sun's a little bit more intangible. You can see it, you can feel it, you can't touch it. That's a little bit like how we learn and work with God. God, we know about him from the Bible. We see him at work, but we, we can't really touch him. He's intangible. So in the Bible, we learn from the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, God gave them jobs to do. Some jobs were tangible, meaning they had to work with their hands and build things like walls or temples. And some other things were intangible, those invisible things that you can't really hold on to, like uh, make friends with other people and build up their spiritual life by praying and working together with other people. So when we think about what a plant needs, water and sunlight, think about what you need too. The physical, you need to eat food, and the spiritual, you need to know God and know other people you can't really hold on to that relationship you have with your mom or your dad or your friends, but you have it, right? It's something that is very important for you to grow with. So remember the tangible and intangible, the physical, the spiritual, the water and the sun. You need both of those things to grow. Well, have a good day. Thanks for watching. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so Gail said that um, the reason we do kids' time here is because we value kids, and that's, that's the official reason, but the real reason is I just love the, the kids' time personally, and it ministers to my soul. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it's both, right? It can, it can be both. Cool. Uh, let's see here. What are we doing? Oh, yeah, that's right. I have another announcement. Let me make this big screen. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. Cool. So um, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, uh, we've shared a, about the fact that we're going through, that's also not right. Well, you guys can live with the, the address bar on the top, right? 
All right, uh, so if you've been here the last couple of weeks, um, I've, I've specifically taken time to share with you about uh, a reorganization that our church is going through in terms of the way leadership works here. And I just wanna point at that again, if this is your first time hearing that, uh, we're, we're restructuring the way leadership works in our church, um, redefining my role and the role of some of the other leaders. We're licensing some new pastors. Uh, and the reason that we're doing that really is, is twofold. One, we want to align people's work with their passion and their skill, which we think makes people happier, right? Um, but also we think that that will make our church more, well, fruitful in our mission, right? That we'll actually be better at reaching our neighbors and loving them well in the name of Jesus, that we'll be better at training each other in our faith, that we'll actually be able to, I guess, just be people who are with God more, that that's just at the heart of who we are. If we, you know, give people work to do in ministry here in the church, that lines up with how God has wired them. So that's really what that's about. If you have more questions about that, you know, there's a, a one-page document, there's stuff on the website. If that's not enough information you want more, you can absolutely get more. You can come talk to me or any of the other leaders about what's going on and why it matters or why, how it happened, any of that stuff. Um, so we're talking about Ezra and Nehemiah. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about Ezra and Nehemiah today and then, and then next week as well. Uh, and then our plan is actually to do more of an in-depth study of the book of Daniel. So for those of you guys who are curious about where we're going, that's where we're headed. And we'll do that more the way we, we typically go through a book of the Bible, um, which is chunk by chunk, reading every verse. So that'll probably take us a year, I would imagine. So um, I'm sure, you know, we'll, we'll probably take a few weeks off for things like Easter and Christmas over the next year. But for the next year as a church, we're going to be studying the book of Daniel together. Uh, but for today, we're, we're talking about Ezra and Nehemiah. And I'll give you, um, well, so here's the thing. The, the, that kid's message was fantastic, right? And it points at the fact that God's, God, God likes to see beautiful things grow, right? And he hates it when things are broken or ruined or destroyed, right? That's just who he is. That's the way, I don't know if it's fair to say that's the way God is wired, but that's the way God is wired, right? That's how his temperament and his personality is. And it doesn't matter if those are spiritual things or physical things. God enjoys making beautiful things grow. And God hates to see beautiful things destroyed. He doesn't like desolation. He doesn't like brokenness in any area of life. Um, and so today we're going to be talking specifically about how the story of Ezra and Nehemiah highlights that aspect of God's character and that aspect of, of God's kingdom and that aspect of ministry. That, that ministry is not... Um, well, it's not just about what we might think of as the spiritual things. It's also the physical things too. But obviously it's not just the physical things. It's about the spiritual things. It's about both, right? And uh, so these are, I, I had to come up with two working titles for my sermon. I don't know how many of you guys like sermon titles. I kind of like them. But so the, this is the first title is that a wall is a spiritual thing, right? So the story of Nehemiah is the story of building a wall, but it's also a lot more than that, right? And this wall it's not just a random wall. It has a very specific meaning and purpose that really is, you know, so the wall, the wall around a city in that day was connected to its ability to thrive and be healthy as a city. It would be may, maybe something similar to the way like a, a freeway system would work or, or a road system would work in, in our day and age. It was just, it was, a, it was a vital piece of infrastructure, right? And so in that sense, a, a wall then was more than just a wall, but really for the, the Jewish people returning to Jerusalem, returning to their capital after a generation or two in exile, it was even more powerful than that. Right? It was a symbol of their return and their rebuilding and God's favor. It was, it was way more than just a wall. It was a spiritual thing, right? But also, worship is a practical thing, right? And that the act of worship in and of itself, which again, we're tempted to think of worship as spiritual, and obviously it is spiritual. It is about us interacting with God. But, but you know, I mean, when we think about worship, it's like, TV screens and cables and instruments. And I'm sure you guys who aren't on the worship team don't think about all of those things. Unless, of course, there's something wrong with the TV or the speaker or the guitar, and then you're very well aware of that, right? And so, so as much as worship really is at its, 
at its heart. It's about us declaring to God how we feel about him in ways that go deeper than just words, right? That's why we include music and include our bodies in worship because there are things that you can't just say. There are things that you have to sing or you have to dance or you have to move to express. And that's the way that we express to God how we feel about him, right? And how we think of him and, and our relationship to him through that. That's what worship is. And yet, worship has to, it, it has to involve our bodies and our voices. It also, at least, you know, the way we do it today, it involves guitars and, and, and TV screens. And in their day, we might think, well, they didn't have any TVs in the Bible, but they did have symbols and they had to build temples, and they, right? So, like, it always involves this. There's physicality to worship. Anyway, so those are my, my two, t- you got two titles today because I couldn't come up with just one. Right, bonus, <laughs> bonus title. That's the bonus title. All right, so, right, we're going to read a passage of Scripture. So if you want to turn to, we're going to read Nehemiah 1, um, and you can turn there with me. If you want, you can listen. We're going to read Nehemiah 1, 1 through 4, and then we're also going to read 11 through 18. I probably shouldn't do that. I almost coughed into the microphone. You guys would have hated me. I'm just swallowing that one. All right. Here we go, Nehemiah 1.1. 1, 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year when I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and all also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And that goes on. He's got this prayer. But I just want to point at that, right? So the news comes back. It's not good in Jerusalem. Well, what's, what's wrong? Let me tell you about the wall, right? And... Um, Nehemiah hears the news, it's not good, well, why not? Oh, the wall, this is the condition of the wall. And, his, and immediately his heart sinks with the news of the condition of the wall of Jerusalem, right? And so you can even just, again, for us, we don't live in walled cities, so it doesn't really, you're like, I don't know, it's a wall, I guess it keeps people out, right? Is that what walls do? Well, yeah, but there, there's something going on here and, you know, pr- probably the, the thing that, that resonates with me the most is when I first came to Buffalo, uh, I, went to, I was working for the cable company, and one of my supervisors, when he found out I was from California, he's like, okay, here's, here's what you have to know about Buffalo. We lost four Super Bowls in a row. And I'm like, okay, no, 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 no. You need to understand, like, what this, like, we have been in a state of depression as a city for, you know, and I'm, and I'm just kind of like, all right, I guess so. But I've come to understand what that means to the psyche and to the soul of Buffalo and how, how much that hit home for people, right? And that's, this is what's going on with Nehemiah. It's a, it's a football team. It's a football game. Who cares? Well, people care. It matters, right? And, and there's, you know, the function, the function of a football team is maybe not as tangibly or practically important as the function of a wall, but clearly it has that same symbolic spiritual power in the lives of the Jewish people, right? And Nehemiah experiences that, that pain. So we're going to pick it up in verse 11. So he, he's, he's prayed, he's gone to the king, the king has blessed him and said you can go, even though Nehemiah wasn't sure that he was going to get the king's blessing when he did this. And there's reasons behind why Nehemiah was afraid that he might be signing his own death warrant. But ultimately God's favor was on him and he's given not just permission to go and restore the wall, but he's been resourced by the king's resources to go and do this, right? So in verse 11, we pick it up. Uh, it says, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except for the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. 
Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work, right? And so, I mean, really actually, even until preparing to study and preach on these, um, these stories for the last couple of weeks, every time I'd read that specific passage, I just kind of thought of this through the lens of, well, Nehemiah is going to check out the building site to figure out like what materials he needs. And I'm sure that's part of the story. But when you think about it in light of the emotional weight of this project, I can't help but imagine that Nehemiah probably spent half the journey weeping and half the journey excited for, and when I say journey, I mean specifically like the touring of the wall, right? Half the time he's probably weeping over the brokenness of his city and half the time he's like jazzed up and raring, ready to go to build this thing, right? And so this, is, this has got to be an incredibly emotional journey. This is not somebody with a calculator and uh, you know, a pencil and paper taking notes about building materials. This is somebody who is surveying the devastation of his homeland and preparing himself for the task of leading his people in this restoration, right? And so again, <laughs> a wall is a spiritual thing, in, at least in this case, maybe not always. Maybe the wall that you build between you and your neighbor, well, maybe that's a spiritual thing too, I don't know. <laughs> or maybe not, right? Maybe it's just a wall. But in this case, this is something that, that has like deep resonances and it matters not just to people because of what a wall does, but because of what it means and even because of what it means to God and because of what God wants and how God sees them and who they are and who they're supposed to be in the world. Like all of those things are tied up in, in this, this situation, right? Um, but here's the thing, right? So uh, Nehemiah, he comes, he's the governor. Ezra also comes, he's the priest. They're tasked with uh, you know, building the temple and, and building the, the wall, but they're also tasked with doing a lot of other things as well, right? So Ezra, so Nehemiah, is, he's the governor. Ezra, he comes as the priest, and even before them, right? So the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, it's really one story. In the first five or six chapters, we don't even actually get introduced to Ezra. We have Joshua and Zerubbabel, who themselves are this partnership between priest and governor who have come again to, to begin this work. And, and the rest of the story picks up with Ezra and then Nehemiah, another partnership between priest and governor who are working together to certainly rebuild, you know, some infrastructure for the city, but also really to address the spiritual needs of the people, right? Ezra teach the law. And so I wanna read another chunk from Nehemiah where a very different problem gets surveyed and gets addressed by Nehemiah. So this is chapter five, verse one. And we're gonna read, uh, what did I, yeah, down to verse 12. So again, if you wanna turn there, you can. Nehemiah 5, one. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards, although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and I said, as far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the, money, the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. 
Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. And so this is, you know, this isn't a wall, right? This is about the way God's people were treating each other. And the interesting thing about, so the whole charging money at interest thing, that was something that was actually forbidden by Jewish law. They weren't supposed to be doing that anyway. And, you know, I, I'll leave it to maybe there's some economists in the room to decide whether or not we could do away with lending at interest in today's economy. I have no idea what that would look like. Um, for those of you guys who don't think about such things, that's pretty much the way our entire global economy is, uh, works, right? Uh, and God says, don't do it. So, I, like I said, wiser, more intelligent economic minds than mine can decide whether or not that's appropriate. But, but the reality is, is the Jewish people were forbidden from doing it, and they were doing it, and it was causing problems. It was, it was hurting people in the Jewish community. And the, those people came to Nehemiah and said, Nehemiah, you've got to help us out. This is a problem. And Nehemiah steps in, and he responds, right? He responds by teaching the law, and not just teaching it, informing people of it, but reminding people of it and saying, this is who you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be people who follow God's law, who care about the things that God cares about. This is something that God cares about. It's what he's told you to do, and you're not obeying him. Stop it. Be the people that God wants you to be. And it, sa- it says in the story, they couldn't say anything. They knew that they were violating not just God's law, but their own consciences, right? They weren't living up to the commands of God that they themselves had embraced, and they were rejecting those, those commands in their lives. And so this, too, is the work that Nehemiah is called to do, right? This is what restoration is about. And that's what this story is about, is this holistic picture of God's kingdom coming, of, of restoration coming. And so we, we tend to think of, um, you know, so there's a picture of a subway train. We, we tend to think of things as secular or sacred, and that's not really the way Scripture tends to think about things at all, right? Um, you know, I, I've over the years certainly been guilty of, you know, discounting things like business or money or, or organization or planning. or That's all the stuff that doesn't matter. The stuff that really matters is like the godly stuff, right? And of course, like I'm called to be a pastor and that's my, my vocation in life. Um, and so maybe there's, maybe I get a little grace for being um, short-sighted around some of that stuff. But God over and over again through the years has allowed me to see oftentimes through gifted and godly women and men who are not called to do the things that I'm called to do, but are called to use very different skill sets in very different environments you know, to, to play with money or to play with numbers or to play with, you know, I don't know, wood and stone or whatever it is. And, and they're just as valuable to God's kingdom. In fact, sometimes even more so. That's a big part of my story of coming to Buffalo is seeing people who are advancing God's kingdom as doctors or as gardeners or as construction workers or as teachers and realizing, oh, <laughs> that's what this is supposed to look like. <laughs> Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Of course, that makes sense, right? And so we have that kind of way of thinking sometimes in our head, right? That there's the, there's the, the secular and then there's the sacred, right? And there's the, the holy spaces or the holy things or the holy jobs or the, the holy work. And um, that's just not how it works, right? Ezra 3, we read this passage last week. 310. It says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestment with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, he is good, his love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, right? So the construction workers and the musicians got together and threw a great party where they built something and then let everybody in worship, right? That's what this is. And it's like, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like, right? That's this, it's not this divide between sacred and secular and the, the holy work and the unholy work. It's, it's that God actually cares about all of it, right? God wants to make beautiful things grow and he hates it when beautiful things are destroyed. And certainly they're 
Like there are spiritual things that matter, but there are physical things that matter too, and God cares about all of these things. And so I guess, uh, well, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll tell a story. Um, so Tammy and I, this is years ago, we were actually helping to lead the youth ministry at the church in uh, Northern California that, that we were at many years ago. And uh, we took a, took a group of kids down to San Francisco, which was like three or four hours away. So it was kind of like the closest, I don't know, city to where, to where we were at. And there was a ministry down there that did a ton of work on the street. Um, you know, most cities have uh, a, a large population of people that are homeless. San Francisco is even more than that. You know, you don't have really like a winter there, so there's just a ton of people living on the streets. And there was a ministry there that really, they, so they met a lot of practical needs, but really more than anything else, they just were like a church on the street, right? So we went and, and uh, took, again, a group of kids, and we had a worship service where it was just an outdoor worship service where they had been really intentional about bringing in the community of street people. It was, it was like a worship service for them, right? And there were people who were actually showing up just to kind of like, just like you guys did, walk in, sit down, be a part of the church service, right? Um, except for almost everybody that was there were people who were living on the streets, right? And so this wasn't even really a ministry to them. It was kind of like, here, this is your church. Come on in, right? Um, so there's a time of worship. There was some really practical needs that were met, right? So people were, I don't know, there was like socks and food and foot washing, not, not the symbolic kind of foot washing, but the actual kind of foot washing, like you need somebody to help you with like hygiene care or, you know, there was just a ton of different kind of services that went on, but also there just, there was a lot of um, attention paid to treating people as people right? Does that make sense? And it was something that stood out to Tammy and I at the time that, oh, this isn't, this isn't just about like helping somebody with a tangible practical need. You need a, a cup of soup or you need a pair of socks. This is about that and it's also about restoring relationship, restoring a sense of honor, restoring a sense of dignity to people who, um, well, bluntly, Many people don't see them as honorable or as possessing dignity, but God does, right? And so that, that ministry was something that really put those things together. And it wasn't like, okay, now we're going to do the spiritual stuff. Okay, now we're going to do the secular stuff. It was just all together, right? So this divide really is, it's a, it's a false choice, right? We don't actually have to choose. And you guys are probably familiar with the fact that throughout church history, we love to debate about silly things, Right? Um, I think in the, in the Middle Ages, there was a, a really important debate about how many angels actually could dance on the head of a pin. You guys may have heard of that. I've never really read much or studied up on it, but it was, it was actually a real argument that real scholars in the church had. And as silly as that seems, it's actually not as silly to me as the debate that has taken place in our lifetimes uh, where people say, well, should we preach the gospel to lost souls or should we feed hungry people? Which one, you're right, <laughs> yes we should is the correct, right? So in my opinion, that's a dumber debate than how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And the fact that we've ever spent any time as Christians arguing about that seems silly to me because God cares about both, right? And, you know, we, we, we might be tempted to say, well, which one's more important, right? And I mean, I was even thinking about that. Jesus responds to the devil in his temptation by saying, look, Man doesn't live on bread alone, right? But rather by the word of God that, that comes to him. And so, yeah, of course, like we want to prioritize connecting people to God. That is at the heart of what the gospel is all about. But, okay, Jesus said it's not about bread, it's about God's word. But what did God say, right? And doesn't God say that he wants us to be the kind of people who are taking care of the practical needs of others? Doesn't God say that he wants us to be the kind of people that are working for a community where people are not hungry, right? Isn't that actually God's heart too? And so it really has to be this, this coming together of all of those things because, again, God doesn't want to see beautiful things broken. And whether that's people who are alienated from him, right? We've all had that experience of feeling far from God. God wants to heal that and restore that, right? Or it could be conflict between people. God wants to fix that and redeem that. It could be the shame that we experience from sin. It could be the deprivation of living in a broken world. God wants to address all of that. 
And sometimes it looks like building a wall and other times it looks like teaching people to stop lending at interest. Sometimes it looks like, you know, explaining to people who they are in God's eyes and other times it looks like building a building. And, and, it's, and it's all of those things. And at the heart of that is this idea of God's kingdom, right? Of God in, in his, his uh, deep desire to manifest his goodness and to share his love with his creation, all of it matters, right? This is about God setting all things right and putting all things right, whether they're spiritual things or physical things, relational things or, you know, practical, tangible things. God's wanting to do all of those things. And I think probably the temptation for all of us is that we have like a natural leaning, right? I would imagine that there are a lot of you here in this room, you're like, man, I just love talking to people about Jesus. Or, "Mm, I just really like feeding hungry people. Or whatever it is for you, right? I think a lot of us probably have that leaning. And the reality is is that, well, it's, it's both. It's all of it. And so I would just ask you, like, what is it that maybe gets in the way for you? Where, where is your leaning? What is, you know, to identify that and say, yeah, I'm the person who really just, I can get caught up in wanting to make sure that people, like, know about the person of Jesus. And I want, like, that's the thing that I care about. That's, that's fantastic. That's, that's wonderful, right? But what, a, what, what would it look like to just meet somebody's practical needs and vice versa? Well, I just want to make sure that, you know, people are fed or sick people are cared for. Great, that's awesome. But what would it look like to, to actually, you know, to say the word or to say the name Jesus or to offer to pray for somebody in that kind of a setting? And in, in uh, Romans 12, Paul says this, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same functions, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If if it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so that, that is a, a constant refrain in scripture to be the person that God has made you to be and to serve or to give or to, to contribute in the way that God has wired you, right? He's gifted you this way, so be that person. Um, but also, it's an admonition not to do it alone, right? You're a part of the body. And so for those of us who are just really strongly motivated to see people come to faith, or to talk to people about Jesus, or to pray for people, or to address the spiritual brokenness that's in our world, great, do that, do it well, but do it as a part of a body that also is feeding people and addressing the fact that people don't have clothes or don't have medicine, right? Be a part of a team, and vice versa. You're like, man, I just, you know, I I don't know, I see people who are coming out of prison and I know that they just don't have really a hope of making it without some help and, and my heart breaks for them and I wanna go help them. Great, do that, do it to your heart's content, do it as well as you possibly can. Just make sure that you have people there who wanna like pray for those people too or teach them, you know, invite them to learn about scripture, right? And so we're a part of this team of people that God has equipped and gifted and, 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 and sent into different places in different ways with different passions, but it's all about God wanting to restore all of the places where things are broken, right? So that's, that's one way of making this practical, right? Be who you are, but be a part of a team. But the other thing I would say is um, there's also a place for doing the thing that doesn't come naturally, right? For doing the thing that's hard for you to do. And, um, you know, in, in Romans 10, Paul says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Right, and so if you're the kind of like, man, I just want to feed the hungry person, I mean, Scripture makes it pretty clear that people cannot call on Jesus. They cannot enter into a relationship with God. That alienation that people feel from God has to be addressed by somebody saying to them, hey, you know what, I know what's going on, 
and God actually is real and he does love you and he wants to be in a relationship with you. Can I pray for you or can I talk to you about that? That has to happen. Well, so step into that. Try it, even if it doesn't come naturally and vice versa. Maybe you're just like the, I just pray for people. That's my gift. That's what I do. Fantastic. But what would it look like to just, I don't know, offer somebody a meal (laughs) and that's it. How can I serve you? How can I, you know, wash your feet in some way, shape or form? Because that, you know, the, the, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And that, that's the passage where Jesus talks about letting your light shine. And typically people think of that and they turn that into evangelism, right? Well, I'm gonna go let my light shine. by tell, But Jesus says explicitly that they may see your good deeds. So when he's talking about your light shining, he's not actually really talking about being people who are, saying the name of Jesus everywhere we go, at least not in that passage, right? And so what does it look like for people to to be maybe evangelistically gifted or wired, but also to just meet practical needs in people's lives? Sound all right? Is that that some... (laughs) I wasn't aiming for for clapping, but I'll take it. Thanks, Zach. (laughs) So uh, so we'll take some time to reflect, and there's two reflection questions that I want to put in front of you, but probably you should just pick one, I would think, right? So God has this desire for holistic restoration, and the first question is, where is God wanting to restore my life? What, What is it that God really truly desires to do in me? And maybe that's incredibly physical. I don't know, maybe God wants you to get more sleep. I have no idea, right? But what does it look like for God to, <laughs> Lauren said yes, okay. So, but, or it could be something way more spiritual, something connected to your relationship to him or the way you engage with scripture or the way you relate to your spouse or whatever. Um, but so for some of you, maybe that's just the place of reflection is just to sit with that question, ask God to speak to you and begin to talk to God about it. Uh, but maybe for others in the room, it's more about where, where is God at work in the world that he wants to invite you to participate in that, right? Where is God at work restoring others or restoring our city or restoring our world or even just maybe the, the place where you work or, or something like that? And it's like, yeah, okay, I want to interact with God about that. And so um, I'll just invite God to come and minister you, take the next minute or two and engage with that question, engage with the spirit and ask God to meet with you. So we do um, recognize, God, that you're present when we open the word, when we gather in your presence, when we ask you to be with us, you, you just are already here. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal, that you would plant and uproot, that you would allow us to see, that you would encourage us, that you would heal us. Come and have your way, God.
Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, for this opportunity to gather together to worship you in whatever way that looks like. Um, I pray that you are here and present with us, that you are moving in our hearts. I pray that each and every one of us has had the opportunity to connect with you and to keep connecting with you, not only during this service, but as we go back out into our communities. I pray that we carry your presence with us this whole week as we do what we do. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Good morning, Buffalo Vineyard. I'm Abby, and this is Elena, Lauren, and Zach, and together we are going to lead you in like 15 to 20 minutes of worship, and we're just going to take this time to connect and to just release all the stresses that we are holding on to from our jobs, from our life. Um, it's about a time, this is a time to connect with God, to put everything else aside and just to be with him, to dwell with him. Um, yeah, so I invite you to stand and sing if that's what you want to do or worship in any way that you feel the closest to God. So, yeah. Welcome again. here touching every heart. You are here touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you.
is who you are. That 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 is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. He's the one that makes the way. He's the one that provides the path for us to take to wholeness and healing and righteousness and everything good. We can be honest with him about where we are and where we want to be. And we can trust him and put our hope in him. And 
We feel your presence here, Lord, and we thank you. Thank you for drawing us whole um, when all we see is coloring outside of lines and using the wrong colors. Thank you for seeing us as beautiful uh, when we can't see that in ourselves or, or each other, Lord. Thank you for fishing us out of the water. <laughs> Thank you for saving us. We need saving. And we thank you that you have made a way for us, for our salvation, Lord. Help us to get out of our own ways, Lord. Help us to help you with the restoration in our life. Not that you need our help, but Lord, help us to be willing and teachable um, and faithful to you as you work restoration in our lives, Lord. And use us to be a part of restoration in our city, Lord in the lives of others and how that affects the whole world it's just like affecting one life how that it's just like a chain effect lord um, like a butterfly effect if you will we flap the wings here and you don't know what happens on the other side of the world so lord help us to be a part of healing lord in our lives and the lives of those around us we can do that lord even as broken as we are lord because you heal us from within and that radiates out of us, Lord. So we speak life into the people around us who also need healing, Father. Help us to rebuild the walls in our life, Lord. But not the ones that need to, that need to be knocked down and stayed down, but Lord, uh, those places where um, that need to be strengthened, Lord. Um, take our weaknesses and, and use them as only you can, Lord. We love you and we, we thank you for... Uh, yeah, just again for you being here with us right now, Lord. We pray that you would go with us through our weeks, Father, and bless our days. May the peace of God and the strength of his love be with you as you go throughout your week. Uh, go in peace.
in our time, in our day. new
Good morning, Buffalo Vineyard. Welcome to the 1030 service. <laughs> I'm Abby. This is Lauren, Elena, and Zach. And uh, together we're going to lead you in some worship songs. <laughs> They're all still talking. <laughs> all right. So, yeah. Uh, we're going to lead you in some worship songs today. It's not about us up here on stage, as Zach likes to say. It's about your interaction with God and how you're going to connect with him today. So I'm going to say a quick prayer, and then we're going to start singing. <sighs> Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, for this opportunity to come before you, to just lay all of our stresses at your feet, the stresses of life, of work, of family, of friends. Lord, I pray that... You are here in this building, in this place. Lord, I pray that you, your spirit is within each one of us, and I pray that we take this time to put everything else aside and just focus on our connection with you, to interact with you, to worship you, to love you, to be loved by you. I pray that we open ourselves up to being loved by you. Yeah. In your name, Lord. Amen. If you guys want to stand, we're going to we're going to sing. You are here. You are here. Yes. 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. makes a way for us so we can just be who we are where we're at in our journeys and he takes everything that we have and we give him and we can trust him with it
put our hope in you, Lord. Cause you never fail us. You never fail me. Never fail me. My hope is in you. My hope is in you. You never fail me. You never fail me. My
Jesus draws out from my soul with a mighty arm and a strong affection, the fisherman has drawn. Thank you, Lord, um, for the wholeness and the healing that you bring to our lives through the sacrifice of your son, Lord, just through your unconditional love for us, Father. Just draw us near to you, Father, and restore the things in our lives that have been broken down. Um, and just bring us new life as only you can. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much for leading us. Good morning. We are Buffalo Vineyard Church. We're awfully glad to have those of you who are with us here in person and those of you joining us online, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. As Buffalo Vineyard Church, uh, we teach people the way of King Jesus, this amazing king unlike any other king. We do that through regularly encountering God training each other in the faith and uh, effectively serving our neighbors. And when I think about encountering God, do you realize that um, uh, the majority of the worship songs we sang this morning come from our own church family? Uh, and I'm just overwhelmed and blown away every time we sing some of these songs. Uh, God is here and God is at work. And what a great thing to see folks using their gifting. So we invite you all into that, uh, into that process. So... One of the things that, um, again, COVID has thrown us for a loop, hasn't it, on so many different levels, but uh, we're hoping to uh, restore our um, communion times in our church services. So as a leadership, we've done a lot of work and thinking and praying and planning through this. Uh, so we're going to uh, restart that next Sunday, which will be fantastic. We're going to try to do it as safely and as uh, honoring to God as possible. So we have these, you know, like individual cups that have the bread and the wine together or the juice together, which are fantastic. But I just want to let you know if you're still worshiping from home, uh, to give you the heads up that you can have some elements prepared ahead of time for next Sunday's service as we uh, participate in communion together. So... You know, we're a body, we're a family. If one of us suffers, we all suffer. And right now, the Letterber family is uh, going through a really challenging time. And so, uh, as a church family, we're trying to figure out the best ways to support them. Uh, there is a Caring Bridge website that's been started for them, which is a wonderful way to um, have a central place where you can find out what's happening. As a matter of fact, there's uh, journal entries from Christy and Ryan themselves uh, sharing with us, and there's all sorts of ways we can help out, but we can go there first to find out. So it's Caring Bridge. You have to kind of apply and be let into the site. So if you need help doing that, just ask us. Uh, some, one of us will help you do that. Um, but let's keep praying for Christy, for Ryan. Uh, she'll be in Roswell for at least the next three weeks um, or more. So let's keep praying. So we're a family. We're here to have an impact as, as Jesus followers in our neighborhood. And yesterday, there was something fantastic that went on at Five Loaves. And Elena's here to share with us uh, a bit about her experience yesterday. Good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Elena. And for the past few weeks, I have been part of the weekly crew that comes out to Five Lowe's Farm to help out um, with some volunteering work. So this was us a couple weeks ago. Um, but I'm really excited to share a little bit about what happened yesterday. Um, first of all, I was trying to think of why I just love being at the farm so much. And I was actually talking with one of the youth staff workers at the farm yesterday, his name's La Ba, and he was sharing that the reason why he loves being there is because it's so peaceful. And I was like, yeah, that's so true. I never realized how much peace I can find being in a place where you're physically surrounded by the amazing earth that God created and you get to have this opportunity to connect um, with other people and with God. Um, and part of our mission, right, as a church at Buffalo Vineyard is encountering God regularly. So I definitely have been able to experience that with the contemplation times at the farm. 
Um, and yesterday was extra special because not only did we have contemplation, but we had a bunch of extra volunteers show up. Um, so some middle schoolers from Nichols City School um, came with their parents to help out, also some neighbors from, the, from around the neighborhood and people from the church. So we had like 40 people come and participate and volunteer and we were weeding, prepping beds and just talking and enjoying the sunshine um, and then ate lunch together, which was just a really special time of fellowship and to see how there's connections throughout the city that want to come and serve um, not only the farm but just our community. So um, if you're looking for a way to get plugged into, I would just encourage you to think about coming out. Um, we meet every Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, and it's a great kind of opportunity to meet people and then also get some work done and serve the neighborhood. So. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Elena. How exciting. And, you know, here we're a family at Buffalo Vineyard Church, and kids are really important to us in our church family. They are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. And so we really want to uh, make sure we communicate with kids as well, and, and Mr. John does a fantastic job doing that. So it's kids' time. Hello friends, Mr. John here. I'm about to transplant a cabbage I grew in my basement under some lights to the garden outside since it's warm and sunny now. So, do you know about plants and the things they need to grow? So here in my hand, I've got a little cabbage. All right, I grew it from a leftover cabbage from the store and now I can grow it a little bit bigger and grab some leaves when I need them and I'm gonna put it in this hole outside. Plants have roots, see? And these roots grow in the soil and they drink up water that you pour in the soil and other nutrients. So let me put this plant in here. I'm gonna pour my water from my watering can all around. Now the cabbage has some water. Do you know what else uh, plants need? Plants need sun. And there's lots of sun out today. So the sun is going to be eaten up by the leaves of the plant and make some food for the plant. Did you know that like plants, we need things too? Sometimes they're physical things that you can touch. We call those things tangible, tangible things. You can touch water, feel water, right? But the sun's a little bit more intangible. You can see it, you can feel it, you can't touch it. That's a little bit like how we learn and work with God. God, we know about him from the Bible. We see him at work, but we, we can't really touch him. He's intangible. So in the Bible, we learn from the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, God gave them jobs to do. Some jobs were tangible, meaning they had to work with their hands and build things like walls or temples. And some other things were intangible, those invisible things that you can't really hold on to, like uh, make friends with other people and build up their spiritual life by praying and working together with other people. So when we think about what a plant needs, water and sunlight, think about what you need too. The physical, you need to eat food, and the spiritual, you need to know God and know other people you can't really hold on to that relationship you have with your mom or your dad or your friends, but you have it, right? It's something that is very important for you to grow with. So remember the tangible and intangible, the physical, the spiritual, the water and the sun. You need both of those things to grow. Well, have a good day. Thanks for watching. Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, there we go. Got a, we got an echo. So um, I've got, I think, just one announcement to share with you guys before jumping into this morning's message. And that is um, just a, a reminder for if, if those of you guys uh, maybe have missed this the last couple weeks, um, we're going to continue to just point at this. 
for a couple more weeks, but we're going through a reorganization in the way that we do leadership as a church. Um, that doesn't mean anything is changing about our mission or who's, um, who's you know, leading here, but just that we're redefining some of the roles. We're licensing some people as pastors. Um, and the reason we're doing that is really because we want to line people's skill and passion up with their work right? Which hopefully that makes people happier and more joyful in the work that they're doing. But also we think that that's going to make us more effective in our mission as a church. Um, so that's happening. If you have questions about that, if this is, your, you know, if, if you're hearing about this for the first time and um, you're concerned or anything like that, there's, there's more information on the table in the back, but you could also come talk to me um, or you could talk to any of our leaders. And this is something that I'm personally really excited about and I think we should be excited about as a church. So that's my announcement. And then we're going to jump into Ezra and Nehemiah. We've been, we've been talking about the story of Ezra and Nehemiah for the last couple of weeks. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to let you guys know. Um, so we'll be talking Ezra and Nehemiah next week. And then after that, we're going to jump into the book of Daniel. And we're going to do much, so typically when we, when we do book studies as a church, we're going chunk by chunk, reading every verse through an entire uh, an entire book, and we're going to do that with Daniel. We did something a little different with Ezra and Nehemiah. So for those of you guys who are interested, maybe you want to go buy a bunch of study notes or something like that, have at it. We'll be in Daniel in a couple of weeks, um, and it'll probably take us close to a year to get through Daniel. Um, but Ezra and Nehemiah, so that uh, that kid's time message from John uh, talking about how plants need, you know, they need physical stuff, but they also need maybe less physical stuff, and that that points to the reality of what we need as people, that, you know, as a kid, you need food, but you also need love, right? And uh, that as, uh, as people, God cares about both aspects of who we are, the physical and the spiritual. And I think that the story of Ezra and Nehemiah is very much a story that highlights that, right? They're, these are men who were given the task of building some buildings, but also they were given the task of teaching people how to live in relationship with God, right? And so these are two very different kinds of tasks. So um, really what that points at is, it points at God's heart, right? God cares deeply about making beautiful things grow. And God cares deeply about um, any, any time beautiful or living things are destroyed. And it doesn't matter if that's something physical or if that's something spiritual, if that's something that, you know, is connected to what we might think of as just like the infrastructure of a community or what we might think of as, you know, the, the, the heart and soul of a community. He cares about all of that stuff, right? God made the world that we live in. He made the things that we interact with. He made stuff. He made food. He made trees. He made, you know, I mean, you, you were celebrating with us about Earth Day and the fact that God made the earth and, and we get to live in it, right? He, he, he likes all of these things and he enjoys making beautiful things thrive and he cares about beautiful things being destroyed regardless of what they are or where they are. And, and so that's what his heart is in sending Ezra and Nehemiah and the Jewish people back to restore the, the Jewish city and the, the covenant people in their homeland. He's, it's this holistic picture of restoration that God has in mind. And so um, my working title, I actually, I couldn't come up with one working title. I had to have two. So you guys get a bonus title this morning. Um, so this is, this is my first title for this morning's message. A wall is a spiritual thing, right? And, um, well, yeah, let's, let's, I'll give you both titles and then I'll tell you the story. So a wall is a spiritual thing. And the other one is worship is a practical thing, right? So both of those are, 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 I mean, we tend to think of walls as, well, it's just a physical thing. It's a wall. But as we are going to read in this story, the wall means a lot more to the Jewish people than just a wall. And, you know, obviously we live in a day where we, we don't really live in, you know, Buffalo doesn't have a wall. We don't need a wall. So it's hard for us to understand the function of a wall. But in that day, a wall was actually an important, it was a practical tool for the, the health and well-being of a large city, right? But really in this story, the wall is even more important than that. And we're going to talk about that. But also worship, again, worship is something we tend to think of as, you know, spiritual. And yet, you know, we, we have microphones and TVs and guitars and sound systems for our worship. And I know that a lot of us 
maybe we get annoyed by that stuff or we, we try and think about that as like not really a, what worship is about, right? But even in, in the, the days that scripture was written, right? They had symbols and they had instruments and they had, you know, incense and buildings and like these were all a part of worship then too, right? And again, worship ultimately is about us pouring our heart out to God. It's ultimately about us communicating to God how we feel and we do that through music because there are some things that you can't communicate merely with words. It requires more of us to, 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 to pour more of ourselves into it, right? And that's what worship is. It's us declaring to God as a community how we feel about him or what our commitments to him are. And yet also it's all of this tangible, practical stuff too, right? So we're gonna be talking about that this morning. Does that sound all right? It's not too shabby. Um, where am I starting? No, not in Isaiah. I was gonna start in Isaiah, but... We'll just preach Ezra and Nehemiah. Yeah. Something like that. So Nehemiah, verse one, if you or chapter one, if you guys want to turn there with me, you can. So we're gonna read Nehemiah one, one through four, yep, and then probably eleven through twelve or eleven through eighteen. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So again, what just happened, right, is Nehemiah is, he's a high official in in the court of the king far away from his homeland and he has relatives come back who have, you know, they've come from where the exiles have, some of the exiles have returned to Jerusalem. They come back to Susa and they give a report to Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, how's everybody doing? How's Jerusalem? Really bad. Really, what's going on? Let me tell you about the wall. It's broken down, right? Which again, what's the big deal about the wall, right? But you can tell that there's more going on than just, like if I told you, man, ah, you know, there's a bunch of potholes on my street. You'd be like, okay, that's a bummer, but fix the potholes, what's the big deal? But you can tell from the way Nehemiah responds to this that this hits him in his soul, right? There's something painful about the news that the wall is broken down. And when I was thinking about this this week, I couldn't help but reflect on um, the way that I was introduced to the city of Buffalo when I first moved here. And uh, one of my supervisors, I was working for the cable company, and I'd been in Buffalo for a month, and he found out that I was from some other place. He said, oh, well, this is what you have to know about Buffalo. What do you think he told me? We lost four Super Bowls in a row. That's exactly what he told me. You need to know this about Buffalo. A dead, deadpan. Like, he's not making a joke, right? Like, he's, like, handing out the antidepressants as he's telling me this story, right? It's like, you need to understand, we lost four Super Bowls in a row. You're not from around here. You need to know what this means to us. And it was kind of like, I don't really understand what you're talking about. But as I've lived in Buffalo for the last, whatever, 15 years, I've come to understand what that has meant to the city, Right. Um, And you could argue about whether or not a wall should be more important than the Buffalo Bills or whatever. But the reality is is that this is how Nehemiah took this news is the same way, right? The way that many people who grew up in Buffalo and have loved the Bills their whole lives received that and and responded to that, right? And so again, you go on uh, through the rest of this chapter. Nehemiah goes to the king. He asks the king for permission to go back and work on the wall. The king gives him permission uh, and actually gives him resources to go back and fix the wall. So now Nehemiah has gone to Jerusalem and we read in verse 11 that after going to Jerusalem, staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except for the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I said nothing to the Jews 
or to the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. So I I mean, I have no idea how many times I've read this passage, um, but until this week, every time I read it, I read it as, um, you know, Nehemiah inspecting the wall. Like I've built plenty of things in my life. You go kind of survey the scene, you figure out what materials you'll need, and then you make a purchase list and you go out and buy it and you get to work, right? That's how that works. And I always had that in my head as I was watching, you know, reading Nehemiah going out and, you know, wandering around the walls of Jerusalem and figuring out what he needed to do. But this week, it it kind of clicked that maybe he was doing some of that, but that's not really what this was about. This was about surveying the devastation of his city, right? I am sure that there were many moments along the way that he wept, looking at the walls, right, where he mourned the situation. But I'm also sure that there were probably lots of moments where he was filled with hope and filled with determination too. Like, we're going to put this thing back together, right? And that's, a very, that's very different than me looking at the place where I'm going to build my shed and drawing out a list of materials that I need to go to Home Depot and build, right? There's something very different going on here. And that's because as much as this, you know, the governor Nehemiah is here to do an infrastructure, infrastructure project, right? He's here to build a wall. This is about something way more than that, right? This wall is something that actually has symbolic and spiritual connection to the, the people of God being in their city, restoring it, rebuilding it, owning it, living in it, being in right relationship with God, taking care of the, the, the place that God had given them to live in, right? There's something way more going on than just, well, there's a wall that needs repairing and we're going to repair it, right? And this is, this, this is certainly physical, certainly practical, certainly tangible, and yet also deeply and profoundly spiritual and emotional and relational, right? So, a wall is a spiritual thing. Very different story, also from Nehemiah chapter 5. Uh, we'll read to verse 1 through 12. So again, if you want to turn there, you can, or you can just listen. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery." Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind, and then I accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them, and I said, as far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles, but now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. 
So again, just to clarify what's happening here, right, is first of all, the, the Jewish people were forbidden by God from lending money to each other at interest. It was something they weren't supposed to do, but they were doing it here. And not only were they doing it, but the rich people were doing it in such a way as to take advantage of the, the situation that they found themselves in. The rich people were making money by oppressing the poor people during a time of national crisis. Right, that's what's going on here. And they were doing it in a way that God had expressly forbidden them from doing, right? And so Nehemiah gets angry, he calls them together, he confronts them on it, and, and you can see, right, he's accusing them to their face and they respond with silence. They know that what they're doing is wrong. They know that they're not obeying God's law. They're not even obeying their own consciences. Right? They know that what they've done is wrong and Nehemiah is stepping in to address this. And so as much as Nehemiah's task is about building a wall, Nehemiah's task is also about teaching God's people how to honor God, how to live as holy, righteous, just people, how to treat their neighbors well, right? And this too is a part of this task. And so, you know, Ezra is, is called to lead worship, but also to build a temple. Nehemiah is called to build a wall, but also to teach people to live just lives. And so, again, there's this picture in this story of this holistic restoration that God has for his people. It's about, you know, it's not just about building walls. It's also about identity and worship. It's not just about worship. It's also about building a temple. It's about all of these things. And I guess... Um, Yeah, I mean, we as, as certainly myself, I think a lot of us as Christians, we can get tempted to think of things as secular and sacred, right? Certain things are kind of like the, you know, I mean, for me, I, as a pastor, there have been times in my ministry where I've been tempted to think of things like money or, you know, strategic planning or accounting or all of that stuff. It's like, ah, that's all the secular stuff that doesn't matter. Like what the truly important stuff is, you know, the, the people and the prayer and the, the gathering. And, um, and obviously, it's, it's, there, there's a little bit of grace there because that is what God has called me to do and what God has called me to pay attention to. But the reality is, is that that's not actually how it works, right? It's not that the world is, is separated into some things that are sacred and other things that are secular. That's not actually how it works in Scripture. And I think this story really points at that, that we live with this this division between sacred and secular sometimes in our head, but that's not the way God sees it at all. Uh, and there's a, a, a good story that um, uh, from, from, this, this, um, from this, this book that highlights that and also a story from, from our life too that I think really points at this reality of all of this stuff just kind of going together. So in Ezra 3, um, we read that when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestment with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, he is good, his love toward Israel endures forever. Right? And so you have this picture of construction workers and worship leaders gathering together to have a worship service. Like that's, that's a cool picture, right? And they built a temple and then they went in and worshiped in it. It's like, yeah, that's, that's this picture of, of what, so what's sacred and what's secular? Are we going to say, well, what the construction workers did doesn't matter? Uh, what the, the worship leaders did is more important, right? It's this holistic picture of all of this. And uh, we, Tammy and I, this was years ago, so you weren't a part of this story, Zoe, before you were born. Um, we <laughs> were helping to lead uh, the youth group at the church in Northern California, and we took a group of kids to um, a ministry in San Francisco, which was kind of the closest major city to where, where we were living at the time. And um, to, it was kind of like a short-term missions trip for, for these kids. And we went and worked with a ministry that basically was kind of like a, a, a church on the street. They did a lot of work with folks who were living, um, who, were, who didn't have homes, who were living on the streets in, in San Francisco. And there were some, some of the things you would expect to see, right? It's like, here's some soup, Here's some socks, like meeting tangible needs. But also, it was really cool. I mean, some of the things that we saw there, the, the whole, the, like our whole time there started with a worship service. And it was, it was like a church where the people who were in the congregation were folks living on the street. And it was less about here's a service that we're providing for you. And it's more like, just like you guys all came in, you sat down, you're a part of the congregation. They came in and they worshiped. 
And it's like, hey, like this is actually a community of people that includes folks who are living on the streets, right? And it was just, the, it was a community that included everybody. Uh, and you really just got the sense of there are both tangible needs that are being met, but there's also actually treating people like human beings, like there are spiritual and relational needs. One of the things that I, I ended up going out with a team that um, they would, so there's just a ton of prostitution in the specific neighborhood um, that we went to. And most of, the, most of the people prostituting themselves were young men on the streets. And um, we, uh, again, I, this, we just went with this team. This is what they did like week in and week out. This was their ministry. But they would go out and they would give out bag lunches and they would give out flower roses to the, the people who were on the streets selling themselves um, with just a, the simple message of like, hey, like God loves you, he cares about you, and so do we. It was super simple. And, you know, there definitely were people who received that coldly and people who received that warmly, but it was this clear attempt to say, you know, we're here to help you in practical ways, but also we're here to value you as a human being. Like you matter, you matter to God and you matter to us. And to put all of that stuff together in, you know, it wasn't like, okay, now we're going to do the practical help time. Okay, now we're going to do the spiritual help time. It's like, no, it's all of it together because as human beings, we need, you know, we need food for empty bodies, but we also need love for our souls. We need to know that God is there and that he cares for us, but we also need I don't know, clothes on our back. Like we need all of that, right? And God cares about all of that. And this isn't something that's divvied up into things that are more or less important. God actually cares about all of it and his heart breaks when anything is broken or corrupted. But the reality is, is that we live, we live in this tension, right? And um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm, some of you guys may or may not know this, but in the Middle Ages, the church actually had a debate. It, like import, the, the, the wisest, sharpest, most educated Christians of the day actually fought with each other over the question of how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. I don't know if you guys knew that. How many, how many of you guys knew that? A few of you did, right? Okay. How many of you guys are really disappointed to hear that, right? It's like, oh, seriously. Um, so we fought over dumb things in church history is the point, right? But one of the things that we fought over, at least in my lifetime, I've heard people argue over this, that I think is even stupider than that, is should we tell lost people about Jesus or should we feed hungry people? Which one? Now, to me, that seems like an even dumber argument for Christians to have than how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Clearly, God cares about both, and clearly the church should be doing both, and the fact that we would have any kind of an argument over which one of those things is more important means that we're missing something about who God is and what he cares about, right? And having said that, I would imagine every single person in the room gravitates towards one side of that equation, yeah, you can go tell people about Jesus, I'll feed the hungry people. Yeah, you can do all that, like, do gooder stuff. I'm going to do the real work of the gospel, right? Like, everybody kind of has that, that natural gravitational pull towards one side or the other, I think. Um, and, and the reality is, is that both of those are rooted in Scripture, right? Uh, in Paul, uh, Paul in Romans says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Right? Go tell people about what God has done for them. Invite them into relationship with God. Tell them about the work that Jesus has done on the cross. Tell them that they're forgiven and that they can come back into relationship with God. Go do this. This is like, it's important. It matters. This is, this is what we got to do. This is the lifeblood of the church. And then at the same time, Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let the life that you live, a life of service and action towards those who are in need, be the thing that is your witness. Right? And both, like, both of those are in Scripture. You can't take away one of those if you want to live a faithful life. So it's not a choice that we need to make, right? It's not a choice that we need to make, at least not as a church. We want to be doing all of it because the, rea the reality is, is that God hates to see beautiful things destroyed and whether that's 
all of us have felt alienated from God. Every single one of us is in this room knows what it feel like, feels like to feel as though God is distant from us or that there is a barrier between us and him. We know what that feels like and we know what it feels like to have that removed. And God cares about that and he wants that to happen for everybody. All of us knows what it feels like to be in a relationship with somebody where there's conflict where they're trying to hurt us or where we want to hurt them or we don't understand them or, and God cares about that and he wants to address it. All of, it, all of us know what it feels like to, to live in a world where things are run down or broken or where there's not enough food for us or the people that we care about or what, like we know what that feels like and God cares about that and he wants to address it. He wants to address all of it, right? And God's kingdom is God advancing his, his will, his desire, his rule and reign being made manifest in the world. That's, that's what God's kingdom is all about, and that's what we as the church are invited to participate in, which means we're going to be a part of all of it, right? We're going to be a part of all of it. But here's where, I guess, maybe th- this gets practical, Um, So in, in Romans 12, Paul writes this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generously. And if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so there's this clear teaching in scripture here and other places to figure out how you're wired and then just go and serve out of that place, right? And so for those of you in the room who, you know, you just, well, yeah, I don't know, maybe you you have this pull towards people who have been in prison and you know that when they get out of prison, it's gonna be hard for them to make it in life. And so you're like, man, I, I think God cares about that and I wanna step in and help them figure out how to make a way in this world. Well, then you probably should do that right? That, that should be a thing that Christians should do, right? Or if you are somebody, you're like, man, I just know that whenever I see somebody who just feels beat down or ashamed, I really want them to know how much God loves them. And I just have this burden to communicate God's heart to them, to pray for them. You, you probably should do that, right? You probably should take the opportunity to share God's love with people, to tell them about Jesus, to pray for them. Like, that's probably what you should do. And so, but, but here's, here's, here's the trick, right, is we should do all of that stuff together. So the person who is, you know, praying for people and sharing their faith with people should probably be friends with the person who is also, you know, figuring out ways to, to build programs that help, you know, recently released, um, folks recently released from prison re-enter society. And those two people probably ought to work together and do both things at the same time, right? So we should be a part of the body where we're, we're, we're actually providing for the, the holistic needs of our neighbors in ways that address their spiritual needs and their physical needs together. Just like Nehemiah is building a wall and also teaching people how to obey the law. And Ezra is helping to build a temple and also walking inside with the community and leading them in worship inside of that temple, right? That, that we're engaged in that same kind of work together as a community. Is that all right? Yeah. So probably the last thing I would say, just as, as practical advice, as much as we want to kind of like know our lane and stay in it and then work with a team, I think there's also a time and a place to just do the thing that isn't really doesn't really come naturally to us as well, right? That, that, that call to share our faith, that, it, that actually is something that is for all of us. There aren't some Christians with the gift of evangelism and everybody else gets to stand by and watch. There are some people with the gift of evangelism and they should probably be the ones in charge or in charge of training or whatever, but really all of us have opportunities to share our faith to say to our neighbors, man, that really sounds bad. Can I pray for you? Or, wow, like I was in a situation like that. Can I tell you how I feel like God 
showed up in my life when I was there, right? That is something that everybody who is a follower of Jesus should be able to do and should look for opportunities to do. And maybe for some of us, we relish those opportunities and for others, we're scared to death of those opportunities, but they're for all of us, right? And also for, for those of you or, or those of us who have that, just that strong desire to talk to people about Jesus, that has to also be coupled with like real concern about people's physical needs, right? When people are in pain, when they're hungry, when they're scared, when they're lonely, those are things that Jesus clearly cared about and clearly wants us to care about as well. And so there's a time and a place to say, this is what I'm good at and this is where I will serve and where I will, you know, this is my part of the wall that I'm gonna build, so to speak. But maybe there's a time and a place to, to do something else as well. That sound all right? That good for this morning? Cool. So we're gonna, we'll take a little bit of time to reflect. And there's two questions I would actually say, probably you should just pick one to focus on and that some of you in, this, in the room this morning are watching. Um, the first question is for you and some of you, maybe the second question for you is the place that God wants to work. And so, you know, this holistic picture of restoration, when you think about your life through that picture, where is God wanting to do work in your life? Right? Maybe it's something super physical, maybe it's something super spiritual, um, but where is God wanting to do work of restoration in your life? Um, and so you can take some time this morning to just interact with that question, ask God to speak to you and begin to talk to God about that. Uh, or maybe for some of you in the room, it's the second question, which is where should I be working to restore others? Where is God calling me to be part of his restorative work in my city or in my world or at my workplace or at my home? Um, and again, that's a place for you to ask God to speak to you and for you to begin to talk to God about that. So Spirit of God, we, we know that you're present, but we invite you to come. We invite you to come and minister to us. Help us to see, reveal yourself to us, reveal your heart to us. Give us the tools that we need. Give us the direction that we need. Give us the healing that we need, Lord. These are words from the prophet Isaiah. They're words that Jesus spoke at the outset of his ministry as in many ways what you could call the, the mission statement of his work. He said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in the riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. This is God's heart. It's God's heart for you. It's also God's heart through you to the world around you. So I'd invite you to stand up. And one of my favorite benedictions in scripture is from Hebrews, the, the very end of Hebrews. And uh, the author basically says, may the God of peace, the God who puts all things right and puts all things in their rightful place, may he give you the tools that you need to do what he wants you to do. And may he work in you the things that make him happy. Right? And so that's my, my prayer and benediction to you this morning. May the God of peace equip you with all the good things you need to do his work. Go in peace. Amen.